Okay, so we all just heard this story. Jesus' first miracle. Someone needs to be fired. See, if I were Jesus, I would fire my publicist. It's his big reveal, the first miracle, his first foray into public ministry. The text says that in this miracle, he revealed the glory of God for the first time. This is his first show of power, the revelation of the glory of God, and he turns water into wine. Someone ought to be fired. You know, we tend to judge miracles based on what would happen if the miracle hadn't been performed. If Jesus hadn't stretched the five loaves and two fish, thousands of people would have been hungry. If he hadn't raised Lazarus from the dead, Lazarus would be dead. Mary and Martha would be distraught. If he hadn't changed water into wine, people would have sobered up. <laughs> Someone needs to be fired. See, this is a turning point. Jesus' first miracle, and he helps wedding guests remain on a wine binge for days on end. This is a horrible first miracle. First, he actually stole this trick from another god. It wasn't even original. He's a copycat. You don't want your first miracle to be a copycat miracle. If you're familiar with Greek mythology, you might know of the god Dionysus, the god of wine, the god of abundance. Wine was the symbol for all things wonderful and abundant. Every year, there'd be a big celebration in Dionysius' honor. I'm talking a big blowout party, the kind of party you warn your children about. There's drinking and lots of it, all kinds of debauchery. But the night before the party, the worshipers of Dionysius would fill large vats of water and leave them overnight. By morning, the water was turned into wine for the party. The god Dionysius was showing his power, was showing what abundance was and where to find it. I never went to those kind of parties, though I'm sure none of y'all ever did either. But is that, is that abundance? Is that all we want? So, so maybe Jesus knew what he was doing after all. He was trying to reach the Greeks and not just the Jews. So he was doing something familiar enough for the Greeks to understand, but adds a little twist at the end, takes it a step further. He starts with the familiar and then pulls us forward. He takes the show of power associated with the good life offered by Dionysius and matches it, but he does it in a different context. Yeah, he does that at a party, but it's a different kind of party. He does this at a wedding. Now, a wedding is when two people decide they want to give their relationship over to God. It's a celebration of the love between two people and what can happen when that love is founded on and wrapped in the presence of God. Abundance is found in this, says Jesus with his miracle. Abundance, the good life, is found in relationships wrapped in the love of God. Okay, I get it. I'll cut him some slack, but someone still needs to be fired. Because you had all those empty wine casks there, typically made of clay. They had special ones just for weddings and parties like this. They were made to be refilled. So why not just fill the empty ones with water and then have that be wine? It'd be like refilling one of those Francia box wines and then you can just use that handy spout again. That They were made for this. Wouldn't that have made sense to use the empty wine casks to make more wine? I mean, why would you have the servants take these giant heavy stone jars instead of nice light clay ones, these stone jars that were used for purification rituals, each holding 20 to 30 gallons of water, and fill those up. These stone jars were supposed to be used for a special purpose. They were there to keep people ritually clean. You see, the Jews believed that God was clean, and to be in the presence of God, they needed to be clean. And they would wash with water from these jars. Since the reception lasted several days, they would go back to the jars frequently to wash to ensure that they were clean. But if the water was contaminated, if they didn't wash properly, they believed they would be spiritually diseased. 
Eating kosher is based on the same practice of separation. You don't put meat and milk together because meat is a symbol of death and milk is a symbol of life. You keep your wine and your ceremonial water separate. And yet Jesus specifically chose to use those stone jars. Not just one, which have made plenty of wine, but all six. That's 180 gallons of wine, almost enough for a Super Bowl victory party for the Eagles. <laughs> how will the people purify themselves? Now, how will they be clean? Jesus just used the purification jars for wine. It's Jesus' first miracle. It's his first day on the job as a pastor, and he starts off by defiling ceremonial jars and water, making everyone spiritually diseased. Someone ought to be fired. It'd be like me coming in here on my first Sunday back in July and taking the baptismal font and water, pouring the water in the baptismal font, then getting some country time lemonade mix, dumping it in, stirring it up, and then serving you all post-worship fellowship with that. You might be slightly upset. First miracle out of the gate, and Jesus says, I'm going to offend all of you and make you spiritually unclean. Some turning point, huh? But that is exactly what Jesus planned for. He's planning a turning point in the entire Jewish religious system. So what, what if the reason that Jesus did this is because it was going to serve as a metaphor for his entire ministry? Jesus never just did things on a whim. He planned everything. We'll look in a couple weeks about how Palm Sunday, his march into Jerusalem, was plan down to the moment. So it's a metaphor for the way that Jesus is going to be operating in the lives of these people around him. Jesus understood that religions have this tendency to get extremely rigid. They have a natural trajectory to become increasingly brittle over time, less flexible, less responsive or malleable. The reason for this is because religions emerge to preserve things. Something so amazing, dramatic, wonderful happened at the birth of Christianity that we wanted to create structures to retain and preserve and make sure that thing lived on was passed on. But at some point, religions have this ability to turn on themselves and constrict and suffocate the very thing that was so beautiful. They struggle to remain responsive. This isn't just religions. This happens to us as individuals. We try so whole, hard to hold on to a part of our lives, a part of us, a memory that we become so rigid, so hardened, that we suffocate the life out of it. Like Lenny from Of Mice and Men, we suffocate the thing we love. We have to be flexible. Architects in Tokyo learned the best way to protect buildings from the frequent earthquakes was to make them flexible, able to bend and sway. When I was in Illinois, we had some really bad winds one summer, and we lost six trees in our yard, a bunch of pear trees and hardwoods, because the wind came and they just snapped. The only ones that survived were the softwoods, the pine trees that could bend and not break. It's like the Patriots' defense bends but doesn't break. I hope you're keeping track of how many references I'm making in this. There'll be a test later. So those buildings were constructed that were constructed too rigid would just crumble. If it's all concrete, it's not built to sway when the earth shakes, it's going to fall. In South Carolina, we learn the history of Fort Moultrie, a fort in Charleston, South Carolina, that withstood a barrage from the British in the Revolutionary War. The fort was constructed with palmetto logs. They were soft enough to bend and absorb the blow from cannonballs instead of splintering and shattering. It's why the palmetto tree is on the state flag. We need to be flexible. Our organizations, our institutions, even our religion needs to be able to bend. So this is kind of a lesson in the physics of spirituality. That which doesn't bend breaks. 
And this is one of the most painful parts of following Jesus. He has this incredible habit of taking the things we hold dear, things that we believe are sacred, that we ascribe meaning to, things that are deeply important to us, things like ritual purity washing stations that were essential to the very heart of their religion. Jesus takes what we hold on to too tightly and messes with it, upends it, transforms it, all for our growth. This whole miracle is a metaphor for how growth happens. Jesus comes along and basically says, what you have going on is good, but I want to take you a step further. I want to take you somewhere different. Will you come and follow me? Jesus did not come along and condemn what the Jews were doing. He didn't say, these ritual purification jars are silly. Let's just get rid of them. What Jesus did might have been offensive, but not destructive. It was creative. He didn't get rid of the jars. He included the jars in the new thing he was doing. It affirms where they started, but it draws them beyond. It includes where they were. Did you look at the front of the bulletin today by any chance? Does that look familiar to you? It's a drawing done by Liz Gowron. So it's our communion pitcher and our cup and our plate and our bread. We've had that on bulletins for such a long time. It's part of the church. It's part of our history, a long history. And yet it's also new. It's a fresh take on something we've had for a very long time. The communications committee was intentional about saying, you know what, we really like it when some of our church members who are artists draw something for the bulletin. It's, it's creative, it's organic, it comes from us, and so it's new, it's fresh. And yet it includes that, which is part of our history, that we've had for a long time, but it's in a new way. That's what Jesus is doing. In school, I learned basic arithmetic. Two plus two is four, and that was good, but I couldn't end there, could I? For a while, I, I had to stop at arithmetic. I couldn't have done more. I was eight. Are you eight in first grade? I don't know. It's what I needed to know at that point in my life, but I later had to learn division. I didn't forget arithmetic. In fact, I needed it for division, but I couldn't just remain in arithmetic and function in a world of division. Eventually, division gave way to algebra and trigonometry and calculus that I learned overnight, if you were here a couple weeks ago. <laughs> I needed to learn those things, and I had to move forward. That sometimes meant changing my thinking about how numbers work, what they are. It's not that arithmetic is bad, but my teachers wanted me to move forward. Jesus wants to pull us forward throughout the Gospels. He takes the old ways of thinking, old religious traditions, even old laws, and doesn't get rid of them, but he pulls us forward into a new way of understanding them, and it begins here with his first miracle. He says, instead of jars of purification, I'm going to give you jars of celebration and abundance at a place and a time where your relationships are wrapped in the love of God. You might have heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. We look back on that and we think, well, well that's kind of barbaric. But back then it was actually very progressive because back then if someone took your cow, you took their head. It was kind of a disproportionate response. So an eye for an eye was meant to level things out, to make things more fair. And that worked for a while. But later Jesus said, you know what, we can do better than that. You've heard it said an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And that worked and that was a step forward. But now I tell you, turn the other cheek. And that's hard. I don't know about you, but I still struggle with that one. Jesus is pulling us forward. Do you remember the classic movie, Back to the Future? I hope you all have seen it. If not, go on Netflix and get this right away. So Doc Brown built a time machine out of an old DeLorean, because that just makes sense. And it needed a few things to travel through time. It needed energy first. For, for 25 Stephen points, how many gigawatts did it need? 
Anybody? 1.21, 1.21 gigawatts, which is a lot, so much so that he had to steal some plutonium. It's natural. And he needed speed. How fast did the DeLorean have to go? 88 miles per hour, good job. Several of you get 20 Stephen points. It's not as tough as the gigawatts question. So he needed some distance to get up to speed. But at the end of the movie, Doc Brown comes back from the future and says something has happened and he needs Marty to come with him. But this time, somehow he just throws some garbage into the DeLorean instead of plutonium to give it power. Same DeLorean, same flux capacitor, but new fuel. They all get in the car and head out on the road. Now Marty assumes that everything is still the same as always. They would need to get up to 88 miles per hour. But they only had 100 yards of road. How are you going to do that? They would not have enough room to get up to 88 miles per hour. We don't have enough road, Marty yells. But to Marty's surprise, the DeLorean slowly rises in the air, turns around, and Doc says, Roads. Where we're going, we don't need roads. Jesus is coming to these Jews at this wedding and saying, these jars for purification, where I'm taking you, you won't need them in the same way. There's nothing wrong with them. You're just not going to need them anymore. You won't need to sacrifice animals to be in a right relationship with God. You won't have to wash in special water to be in the presence of God. I'm leading you forward to a new place, someplace wonderful, a place of grace, a place of inclusion, a place in my Father's house where all are welcome. Roads, nothing wrong with roads. You're just not going to need them where you're going. Jesus' first miracle is a turning point. A turning point to a bright new future, a new relationship with God that isn't based on rituals of purification, following certain statutes or laws, or offering certain sacrifices, but based on offering up your life, your relationships, to be wrapped in the love of God and there find abundance. Jesus wants to take us into the future. The question is, how flexible, how open, how limber is your soul to be able to respond to the thing Jesus is going to do if you're serious about growing? Because that's what we do here. We grow in faith. And if you're serious about growing, there will come a turning point where he will confront you, upend and subvert the thing that you hold most dear, and it may even be offensive. It may be the thing you've always thought, you've always been taught to believe, you've always done, or you've always lived with. Maybe a part of worship, a tradition, something or some way it's always been done. And Jesus is going to come along and change it all. But there, he'll be there next to you with this big smile full of life and excitement, turning the car your whole life around in a way you never expect. And he'll tell you, roads, where we're going, we don't need roads. And he will take you into the heart of life and love where you don't need to prove yourself, purify yourself, or punish yourself anymore. The world will be new and it will be free and it will be wonderful. All thanks to God. But it's going to take some movement. There's going to be some new things. So can you have that childlike faith and be flexible? Now, I'm not going to ask you all to touch your toes because I can't even do it. What about your faith? How flexible can you make your faith to be open to what Jesus is doing? Because if you read the Bible... It's a constant new thing, changing the way we think, the way we act, the way we live, the way we do. And the church, the church at its best, is leading that charge to where God is pulling us. The church at its worst is resisting and saying, well, let's just push the brakes a little bit, God, on what you want us to do. But where we're going We don't need robes. 
So to ask yourself, what are my roads that I really love to drive on, but maybe, just maybe, I don't really need anymore to get to the place I really need to go? Let us pray together. Almighty God, thank you that you are a God with us and for us, a God bringing us to new life, making new creation, doing new things. Help us to be open to those new things you're doing, to trust that you have what's best for us in mind, that you can take us to new places full of abundance in life. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.